that used to house a single transistor, we can now fit one billion. And that made it so a computer the size of an entire room now fits in your pocket. And that enabled the invention of things like smartphones and Fitbits and GPS tracking devices. You might say the future is small. As an engineer, I'm inspired by this miniaturization revolution in computers. As a physician, I'm optimistic about what miniaturization could do for human health. I wonder whether we could use it to reduce the number of lives lost due to one of the fastest growing diseases on Earth, cancer. Now, when I say that, what most people hear me say is that we're working on curing cancer, and we are. But it turns out that there's an extraordinary opportunity to save lives through the early detection and prevention of cancer. Worldwide, over two-thirds of cancer deaths are entirely preventable using measures we already know about today. They include vaccines, screening, and of course, stopping smoking. But even using the best tools and technologies that we have available, we can't find some tumors until 10 years after they've started growing, when they are some 50 million cancer cells strong. So what if we had better technologies to detect some of the most deadly cancers earlier, when they were just getting started and could be removed? Well, the vision is that we could save even more lives. Let me show you how miniaturization might get us there. This is a microscope that you would find in a standard pathology lab, and it would be used for inspecting a tissue specimen, like a biopsy or a pap smear. The person looking in this $7,000 microscope would be a pathologist with years of specialized training in how to spot cancer cells. Now compare that to this. This is an image from my colleague at Rice University, Rebecca richards Cordum. And what she and her team have done is miniaturize that whole microscope so that it fits onto the end of an optical fiber in a $10 part. Now, what that means is that instead of taking a sample from the patient to the microscope, you can bring the microscope to the patient. And then, instead of relying on an expert to look at the images, what she and her team are doing is to, tra to train the computer to automatically score healthy versus cancerous tissue. So a decision to treat could be made in the moment. Now, this is important because what they found is that even when they have mobile screening trucks that go out into the community in rural communities and perform cervical exams and take samples and send them to the lab, that days later, when women get called with an abnormal test result and asked to come in, fully half of them don't turn up simply because they can't afford the trip. Now, with the new fiber optic microscope and automatic computer scoring, they've been able to create an integrated diagnostic and treatment van. This van can go out into the community, make a diagnosis, and provide treatment in the moment, and no one is lost to follow up. So that's one example of how miniaturization might save lives. Now, as engineers, we think of this as straight-up miniaturization. You took a big thing and you made it little. But what I told you about before was that computers changed our lives completely when they became small enough for us to take them everywhere. So what does the transformational equivalent of that look like in cancer detection? What if we had a detector that was so small that it could travel through your body, it could find the tumor all by itself, and it could send a signal to the outside world? So that sounds a little bit like science fiction, right? But actually, nanotechnology allows us to do just that. Nanotechnology has allowed us to shrink the parts that make up the detector from the width of a human hair, which is 100 microns, a thousand times smaller to 100 nanometers. And that has profound implications. At that length scale, at what we call the nanoscale, materials actually change their properties. So you could take a very common material like gold. It looks golden in your jewelry. If you grind it down into dust, into nanoparticles, it actually looks red. You can take a more exotic material, like the, this big black crystal of cadmium selenide. If you make nanocrystals out of this material and put them in liquid and shine light on them, they glow. And they glow blue, green, yellow, orange, red, depending only on their size. So can you imagine an object like that in the macro world? It would be like all the denim jeans in your closet are all made of cotton, 
and they glow different colors just because they are different sizes. It's wild, right? Okay, so it's not just the color of materials that changes at the nanoscale. What's just as interesting to me is that the way they travel inside your body also changes. So here's a little movie to show you what I mean. This is a blood vessel in the body, and around the blood vessel is a tumor. Okay, we're going to inject nanoparticles in the blood vessel and watch how they travel from the bloodstream into the tumor. Now, it turns out that the blood vessels of many tumors are leaky, and so the nanoparticles can leak out. Whether or not they leak out depends on their size. So in this image, what you see is that the smaller blue 100 nanometer nanoparticles can leak out, the larger red 500 nanometer particles stay behind. That means, as an engineer, if, depending on how big or small I make a material, I can change where it goes in your body. That's the kind of insight that we're going to try to exploit to make a better cancer detector. So in my lab, we recently did make a nanodetector that was so small that it could circulate in the body looking for tumors. We designed this detector to listen for tumor invasion, the orchestra of chemical signals that tumors need to spread. For a tumor to spread out of the tissue in which it's born, they make chemicals called enzymes that chew up the scaffolding of the tissues. And we designed our detector to be activated by these enzymes. One enzyme can perform a thousand chemical reactions in an hour. And in engineering, we call this one to a thousand ratio a form of amplification. It would typically make a technology ultra sensitive. So we've made an ultra sensitive cancer detector. OK, so now the challenge is how do we get this signal that's in the tumor to the outside world where we can detect it? For that, we're going to use another aspect of nanoscale biology, and that has to do with the kidney. So the kidney is a filter, and its job is to filter out waste from the blood and put it into the urine. It turns out that the kidney is a size-dependent filter. So in this movie, what you're seeing is that the smaller 5 nanometer particles can get out into the urine, and everything larger is retained in the blood. OK, so let's put these three concepts together and show you how it works. So what we've done is make a 100 nanometer cancer detector. We inject it in the bloodstream. It leaks out into the tumor. It's activated by enzymes in the tumor. And a signal is released that is small enough to get filtered out by the kidney into the urine. In the urine, it's in the outside world where we can detect it. OK, so there's one last challenge. How do we detect this signal in the urine if it's so tiny? So it turns out that these signals are just molecules, and they're completely synthetic. They're molecules that we engineered. They're not the molecules that the kidney normally puts in the urine. And what that means is that we can design them to be read out by a tool of choice. So for example, if we make the molecules have a unique mass, we can detect them with a fancy, sensitive instrument called a mass spectrometer. If instead we're interested in something that's very portable and inexpensive, we can design the molecules to be trapped on something like paper, like a home pregnancy test. The choice as engineers is up to us, and it depends on the application that we have in mind. Now, if we're interested in portability and we do choose something like paper, it turns out there's a whole world of formats that are emerging in this new field of paper diagnostics that we have to choose from. OK. so. Where are we going with this? What I'm going to tell you next is my perspective as a lifelong researcher, and it represents a dream that I have. I can't say it's a promise, but it is a dream, and I think we all deserve to have dreams, even and maybe especially cancer researchers. What I'm going to describe to you is what I hope will happen with my technology and what my team and I will dedicate our heart and souls into trying to make a reality. Okay. I dream that one day, instead of going into an expensive facility for screening, for colonoscopy, for mammogram, for a pap smear, that you could get a shot, wait an hour, and do a urine test on a paper strip. I imagine that this could happen even without the need for steady electricity or a medical professional in the room. 
Maybe they would be far away and connected only by the image on the smartphone. I hope that this means that we could find tumors much sooner than 10 years after they've started growing in patients all around the world, in all walks of life, that this would lead to earlier treatments and that we could save even more lives than we can today through early detection. Okay, so I know that sounds like a dream, but actually we've made incredible progress in the lab already in mice, where this technology is working for colon, ovarian, and lung cancer detection. And the next steps are to try and bring this to patients. So the things we have to do are manufacture a lot of these detectors at scale. We have to show they're safe for use in humans, and of course that it works. And in order to make that happen, we've assembled a team that's dedicated to translating this technology from the lab to patients. I hope I've given you a sense of the power of miniaturization in medicine. I just want to close with this one thought about our world, um, which is that you often hear people talking about how it's a small world. Our world is getting smaller. We're more interconnected now through virtual conversation than we have been in any other time in human history. For me, it's a small world, but in a different way. The future is small. It's a world where miniaturization and medicine can come together to help us understand, monitor, and treat the human body in molecular conversations at the tiniest scales. And in this small world, the opportunities for improving human health are enormous. Thank you.